to local councils about that. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The power to assert our position as an independent coastal state with full, unfettered access across our waters. <laughs> or a plan to go back into the common fisheries policy with no controls at all. Which of these does the First Minister think is the best plan for our fishermen? First Minister. Well, what I think... What I think, Presiding Officer, is that the Tories raising fishing today is something of an early Christmas present in a political sense. Now, Jason Callow's attack on me on fishing appears to be because I continue to support membership of the European Union. The strange thing about that attack is that so does Jackson Carlow. And so does uh, Ruth Davidson. Here's Ruth Davidson on the 1st of October 2018, just a few short weeks ago. Uh, well, like I say, I voted to remain. I fought for remain. If there was another vote tomorrow, I would still vote remain. So on that issue, there is no difference, it would appear, between myself uh, and the Scottish Conservatives. Where there is a difference is that SNP MPs uh, on the 11th of December, will vote against the Tory deal that sells out Scottish fishermen. Yeah. Because we know, we know that Tory pledges on fishing are not worth the paper they're written on. Let's have a look at them. Uh, the Tories said there would be annual negotiations rather than an overall agreement. The political declaration, though, commits to an overall agreement. The Tories said no link between access to waters and access to markets. The political declaration makes clear there will be such a link. And far from leaving the common fisheries policy behind, the EU statement makes clear that the new agreement will build on the common fisheries policy. Now, the Tories say, ignore all that. We'll get what we want at the end of the day. But the Tories have handed all of the leverage to the European yeah. Union. Because unless the UK agrees to their rules in fishing, uh, they will block a trade deal, and it takes just one country to do that. The truth of the matter is, and I'm delighted uh, that Jackson Carlow has given me the opportunity today <laughs> to highlight this, the Tories, just as they did on the UK's way into the European Union, are selling out Scottish fishermen on the way out. Jackson Carlow. What I actually gave the First Minister the opportunity to do was answer a question, but as is so often the case, it's clear that the First Minister reads out the answer to the question she would prefer was asked rather than the question that is actually asked. <laughs> Presiding officer, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation has been absolutely clear. They say, they say that under the Prime Minister's Brexit deal, the UK will be out of the CFP and that the UK will become an independent coastal state. More than this, more than this, they confirmed just yesterday in an email to every member of this chairman this chamber, they are backing for the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement and the political declaration. Yeah. That's their position. Is the First Minister seriously trying to tell us that she knows more about fish than the Scottish Fishermen's Federation? First Minister. Well, Jesse Carlaw wants to trade quotes. I'm happy to indulge him. Here's the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation. Well, I can only talk personally, having had these years behind me. And I really wouldn't trust the Tories as far as I could throw them. <laughs> Whenever it comes to fishing, it's always been a sacrificial lamb. So is Jackson Carlaw saying that he knows more about fishing than the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation? The fact of the matter is, I know the Tories are desperate to spare their own blushes on this, but they are rewriting history. See, the commitment was never just... They don't like this, but they're going to hear it. The commitment was never just about being an independent coastal state. That's the bare minimum. What the Tories promised was annual negotiations. Now we know there's going to be an overall agreement. They promised no link between access to waters and access to markets. The political declaration makes clear that there will be that link. And of course, uh, the statement issued by the European Union makes it clear that they are going to demand an arrangement that builds upon the common fisheries policy. So I say to Jackson Carlow again, and no amount of bluff and bluster from him today will take away from this fact. The Scottish Tories yet again have sold out Scottish fishermen. Shame on them. Jackson Carlow. 
shame on you, concludes yeah. the First Minister. You know, if shame, was a, if shame was a currency, the First Minister's pockets would be bursting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, if shame was a currency, she might even be able to fill the black hole in her independence financial plans as well. Because what the First Minister is actually saying is she does know better than the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. And the reason the First Minister won't back the Scottish Fish Fishermen's Federation position is because she can't. She's trapped by her own policy in Europe. The plain fact is that for all their posturing and pompous outrage, the SNP's policy <laughs> is to rejoin the EU. And therefore, because there is no way around this, to rejoin the common fisheries policy. Here's what it says. Article 38.1 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union says that being a member of the European Union, as she wishes an independent Scotland to be, means you have to sign up to the common fisheries policy. There are no reviews, there is no reform, that's not a question of liking it, it's a question of lumping it. Isn't it simply deceiving people, First Minister, to pretend this is anything other than a fact? First Minister. I'm sorry, Jackson Carlaw really has to explain this a bit more simply uh, to people because he says uh, that all of that flows from the fact that I want Scotland and indeed the UK to remain in the European Union. But again, I would say to him, so does he, uh, or so he says. When Ruth Davidson says, if there was another vote tomorrow, I would still vote Remain, it seems to me that she wants Scotland still to be a member of the European Union. So if all of what Jackson Carlaw says flows from that, then it applies to Ruth Davidson as much as it applies to anybody else. Jackson Carlaw also talks about the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, pledge uh, and attacks me for somehow not signing it. The Prime Minister yesterday refused to sign the Scottish uh, Fishermen's Federation pledge. <laughs> But you see, we don't need to sign a pledge because we will do what matters. On the 11th of December, in that vote, on that deal that sells out Scottish fishermen, SNP MPs will vote against it. The question for Jackson Carlaw, are all these MPs that are going to sign that pledge, will they vote against that deal or not? Yes or no? Jackson Carlaw. The First Minister's advisers have given her a thick folder of answers to questions I haven't asked. I didn't mention the, any pledge to her. But since she asked, the Prime Minister did the deal that is going to deliver the pledge. So let's just sum up the SNP's position. They accuse Theresa May of selling out and fishing, but it's them who would drag us straight back into the CFP. They demand a renegotiation with whom? The Chancellor of Germany, the Chancellor of Austria, the Prime Minister of France, the President of the EU, the President of the European Council, the EU's lead negotiator, the Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, and even Guy Verhofstadt, together with every other European leader, says this is it. This is the only deal on the table. They say, and I say, back a deal that delivers an orderly exit, pro pro protects jobs, protects jobs and delivers more control of our waters than we've had for half a century. She says, vote down the deal, meaning more chaos, more upheaval, and all in the hope, and all in the hope that it will deliver her obsession with a second independence referendum. That's not in Scotland's interests. That is not standing up for Scotland. First Minister. You know, there's uh, something starting to become very clear uh, at First Minister's questions, and that is the redder Jackson Carlaw's face gets. The more he points wildly across the chamber, uh, the more trouble he is in. You know, he asked me to support a deal that is bad for Scotland and bad for the UK, when the Prime Minister right now can't even uh, persuade her own party uh, to back that deal. That is the reality. Well, the SNP will continue to do what the SNP always does. We will stand up. We will stand up for Scotland. This deal will take Scotland out of the European Union against our will. It will take us out of the single market against our economic interests. It will put us at a potential competitive disadvantage with Northern Ireland and into the bargain it will sell out Scottish uh, fishermen. And all along, yes, I have to say to Jackson Carlow who talks about uh, the SNP using uh, Brexit to advance the case for independence. Well, let me say to him, Brexit does that all by itself. It doesn't need any help from the SNP. 
Uh, and of course, that line, that threadbare line, is just a device for the Tories because the opposite is true. Uh, they're exploiting independence to avoid hard questions on Brexit. Yeah. It will not wash. People see right through it. And increasingly, they're seeing right through Jackson Carlaw and all of his Tory cronies as well. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, this time last week, the First Minister stood up in this chamber and claimed that she had given a very fair settlement to local government. Today, the Accounts Commission reports that funding for councils was cut in real terms by £220 million in the last year. They also say that, and I quote, funding from the Scottish Government to local government decreased at a faster rate, 6.92%, than the Scottish Government revenue budget at 1.65%. That's taking Tory austerity and quadrupling it. First Minister, what's fair about that? First Minister. Well, the Accounts Commission report published this morning, as I'm sure Richard Leonard knows, is for financial year 2017-18. We're currently in financial year 2018-19 and in this financial year the finance minister in the budget uh, earlier this year delivered a real terms increase in local authority uh, revenue budgets. Uh, that is ensuring that local government can protect frontline services and of course he managed that against a backdrop of massive cuts to the Scottish Government budget imposed by the Tories at Westminster. Richard Leonard uh, would have more credibility on these issues if he didn't continue to back a situation that allows Tory governments at Westminster to cut the budget of this parliament. Richard Leonard. Well, um, let me go back to last week, because last week at the same time as the First Minister was telling this chamber that councils get a fair deal, Letters were being dispatched to parents across Falkirk from head teachers warning them of unprecedented cuts, including cuts to support staff. Catherine Snedden of Bowness received one such letter. Her son Lewis is 10 years old. He has a learning disability and epilepsy. Yesterday, Catherine told me, year in, year out, we brace ourselves for cuts to his support network. Take that away from him and other children who need the ACN support packages and our children decline, decline in physical and mental health alongside their medical issues. First Minister, are you seriously saying to the Snedden family that this is fair? First Minister. Well, as Richard Leonard uh, will be aware, or certainly should be aware, the leader of Falkirk Council has uh, since issued a statement apologising for the misleading impression given by those letters and given assurances uh, about education services in Falkirk. And I would hope uh, that Richard Leonard uh, would accept that and also indeed uh, welcome that. In terms of education funding overall, he wanted, he wanted uh, to quote the Accounts Commission report at me uh, earlier on. Uh, what he will read in that report, page 17 of it, and again, uh, this is 2017-18, education expenditure increased by 3.2%, 1.5% in real terms. Uh, that was last year. In this year, local authorities have set education budgets that are at 3.8% higher than the budgets they set in the previous year. That's a 2.3% real terms increase. Uh, and since the SNP came to office, total revenue spending on schools uh, has risen by almost £500 million, which is over 10%. But just to go back to Falkirk uh, briefly, and Richard Leonard might want to reflect on this point, one of the issues that Falkirk Council faces is the cost of Labour schools PFI schemes. Yeah. Labour, Richard Leonard won't like to hear this, I know, but I think it's good that he does. In 1998, Labour signed a PFI deal for schools that had a capital value of £65 million, but the total cost to the taxpayer is going to be £314 million. Pounds. That amounts to a cost to the taxpayer of £13.3 million pounds a year. I think Labour should be apologising for that. Richard Leonard. <laughs> Presiding officer, the Audit Commission report says Scottish Government revenue funding to councils reduced by 2.3% in real terms in 2017-18.
the financial outlook is for reductions in Scottish Government revenue funding to councils. And let's be clear about this, Falkirk is an SNP-run council. These council cuts are made by an SNP government in Edinburgh. And it has reached the point, it has reached the point where head teachers in schools across Falkirk are writing to parents to tell them that this so-called fair settlement means swinging cuts. And the result, the result is that vulnerable children like Lewis and families like the Sneddons face the stress of cuts to the services and the support that they need. First Minister, where is the fairness in that? Isn't Lewis entitled to realise his potential? Don't children like him deserve to receive the education that they need? When will you stop imposing austerity on Scotland's children and start investing instead on Scotland's local services? First Minister. Falkirk Council, in this financial year, set an education budget of £158 million. For Richard Leonard's information, that represented an increase of £8 million on the previous year. As I said earlier on, the Accounts Commission that he likes to quote at me when it suits him on education expenditure uh, said in 2017-18 uh, the expenditure had increased by 1.5% in real terms. We know that in this year spending on schools has increased uh, and we know that under the SNP overall spending on schools in revenue terms has increased by 10.3% and all of that in spite of the swinging cuts being imposed on the Scottish Government's uh, budget by Westminster. And again, I would say what I said earlier on, uh, Richard Leonard would have more credibility on these issues if he didn't continue to support a situation where Tory governments at Westminster were allowed to impose cuts uh, on the budget of this Parliament. When he changes his tune on that, people might be more prepared to listen to him on other matters. A number of constituency supplementaries. The first one, Shona Robinson. Can I ask the First Minister whether she can update Parliament on progress being made in securing a future for Michelin in Dundee in the light of the recent meeting between Derek Mackay and the Michelin executives? First Minister. Well, can I thank Shona Robinson for uh, raising this important question. Uh, the Scottish Government remains focused on securing the best positive outcome for the Michelin Dundee site and its workers. Uh, the Economy Secretary had a very productive meeting with Michelin senior executives last Friday where we presented propositions relating to the future of the site and its workforce in Dundee. Uh, the Finance Secretary will convene the third meeting of the Michelin Dundee Action Group tomorrow morning where he will update them on Michelin's response to the proposition and the next steps. Uh, once the Action Group, including representatives of the workforce, have been informed of the outcome of these discussions, the Cabinet Secretary will of course uh, update local members. Uh, we are working with trade unions, Disease City Council, the UK Government and right across political parties, including with local MSPs, to achieve the best possible outcome for the Michelin site and all of its workers. Annie Wells to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Annie Wells. Thank you. The closure of Cowlair's decontamination unit in Springburn has led to the cancellation of over 700 operations across hospitals in Glasgow, some of which have been major. In the papers this week, a whistleblower stated that had this closure occurred simultaneously with a large-scale incident, hospitals would not have been able to cope. The unit has reopened on a phase basis only. But can the First Minister assure me that patients will receive alternative arrangements as soon as possible and outline what action will be taken to prevent this situation from happening again? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I can give that assurance. Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board are already uh, working hard to ensure that patients whose operations were cancelled as a result of this closure uh, get alternative arrangements as quickly as possible. This was a very regrettable uh, situation, but steps were taken as quickly as possible to rectify it. As the member said, uh, Cowlairs uh, is now open again. It opened uh, again on Tuesday, and all appropriate steps will be taken to ensure that a situation like this is never allowed to recur. And then ask that one. Officer. At a time when hate is on the rise, we got some hope. This week saw the Muslim and Jewish community come together to sign a landmark joint communique to call out and challenge Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in Scotland. Muslim and Jewish women born in Scotland together telling how they've been called traitors, been spat at, told to go home and how they're scared of travelling on Scotland's public transport system. And this in the same week that we saw the horrific video of the young Syrian boy being racially abused and assaulted at his school 
in Huddersfield. Silence is no longer an option in the face of such hate. So does the First Minister agree that we can't leave the fight against Islamophobia to the Muslim community? That we can't leave the fight against anti-Semitism to the Jewish community? And actually that we can't leave the fight against all forms of prejudice and hate to any individual community and that it must be a fight for all of us? First Minister. Yes. Yes, I absolutely agree. I would uh, congratulate the Muslim and Jewish communities for the actions they have taken uh, this week. And I would say that the actions of our Muslim and Jewish communities in doing what they uh, have done this week uh, are a better representation uh, of Scotland than those who indulge in hate crime. Um, I absolutely agree there is no place for silence. None of us should be bystanders uh, when it comes to tackling and calling out hate crime. Uh, there's an obligation on all of us, and I say uh, very clearly but very strongly uh, that an attack on any Muslim, any Jew, any member of any minority community should be seen as an attack on all of us, and we should have solidarity and stand shoulder to shoulder at all time. And I uh, say that as First Minister, and I hope I'm joined in that sentiment by every single member of the Chamber. Question number three, Willie Rennie. I am concerned by the First Minister's plan to compromise with Theresa May. Cathy Newman from Channel 4 tweeted last night that the First Minister told her she'd back the Norway option if the Prime Minister put it on the table. But the Norway option takes us out of Europe. It gives us no say in Europe and will damage our economy. So can I plead with the First Minister not to wobble, to stand strong and oppose all and every kind of Brexit? First Minister. Well, sometimes I think Willie Rennie must have been asleep over the last yeah. two years when the rest of us have actually been battling on this issue. So let me set out for him again, and I'll try to do it in very simple terms, what my position is uh, and what the position of the SNP and the Scottish Government is. Uh, our preference, our strong uh, overriding preference, is to stay members of the European Union. Uh, that's why, as I've said in this chamber to Willie Rennie previously, we will back a second vote to allow people to choose to stay in the European Union. And we very much hope uh, that that proposition can command the majority in the House of Commons and SNP MPs will be part of putting that majority together. Uh, but if it can't command the majority, and I hope it can, as we've said for the last two years, uh, we would favour a compromise option of staying in the single market and customs union because that's better than coming out of the single market and customs union and would be the least damaging option uh, for our economy. It's not our first preference, uh, but as a compromise, it is better than the alternatives that are on the table. So I hope that is crystal clear for Willie Rennie and I would simply say to Willie Rennie instead of constantly trying to attack the SNP on this issue yeah. uh, he might one day just think about lifting a finger to try to persuade Labour to back a second vote because if he can do that then we will be able to put that majority together and we can give people across the UK the opportunity to stay in the EU and of course the people of Scotland the opportunity to express that preference for a second time. Yeah. Willie Rennie. This is First Minister's questions, I want to remind her. So the, so the First Minister is opposed to Brexit, but is prepared to back it too. Just yesterday, and this is important, just yesterday the Treasury told us that every kind of Brexit would damage the economy. So when jobs and businesses are at stake, I don't understand why the First Minister is prepared to accept this. The UK Government is on the ropes. Previous loyalists are opposing the Prime Minister. We finally have a chance of stopping Brexit. This is not the time to accept any new kind of Brexit. I was pleased. I was pleased that she told 700,000 people on the streets of London that she was committed to stopping Brexit dead in its tracks. So how could she look those people in the eye if she ends up backing any form of Brexit. First Minister. You know, I'll be corrected if I'm uh, wrong here, but I don't think so. I'm sure I read in the newspapers uh, the other day that there is actually a Liberal Democrat MP in the House of Commons who's going to vote for Theresa May's deal. Uh, uh, there's not uh, any SNP MPs going to do that. So let me try and make it. I fear that Willie Rennie is starting to make himself look just a little bit silly uh, on this yeah. question. 
Uh, the SNP opposes Brexit. We want Scotland and the UK to remain in the EU. We will back a second vote to give people across the UK the opportunity to choose to stay in the EU. Uh, but if we can't persuade, or Willie Rennie can't persuade Labour to come behind that, and that simply cannot command a majority, I hope it can, but if it cannot, uh, not for the want of trying on the part of the SNP or even on the part of Willie Rennie, then it would be irresponsible uh, not to look at the next best compromise that protected jobs and the economy. So that is the position uh, of the Scottish Government, it's the position of the SNP. Uh, the other uh, thing that Willie Rennie never manages to explain, of course, is that how can he justify seeing Scotland taken out of the European Union against our will? Because if there is a second vote and we get the same result all over again, which of course we hope wouldn't happen, uh, the fact of the matter is Scotland would be no better off. So the real question is, uh, will Willie Rennie stand up in that second vote if Scotland votes again to remain? Will Willie Rennie back all options, including independence, to make sure that Scotland can remain in the EU? Thank you. We've got some interest in asking some further supplementaries. I would encourage members to be succinct and answers similarly. John Mason to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. John Mason. Uh, thank you for that. The First Minister may be aware that yesterday was Red Wednesday when many churches were thinking of Christians who are suffering for their faith around the world. Is the First Minister able to raise with the UK or Pakistani governments the case of Asia Bibi and the Christian minority in Pakistan who are not afforded equal rights in that country? First Minister. Well, like many people, I am absolutely appalled by Asiya Bibi's case and by the continued reticence of the international community in offering her asylum now that she has been released from prison. The Scottish Government strongly <coughs> condemns the persecution of minorities, including the targeting of innocent people based on their beliefs. I share uh, John Mason's concerns about religious intolerance and misuse of the blasphemy laws and uh, urge the Government of Pakistan to protect and guarantee the fundamental rights of all its citizens. Uh, the Scottish Government has repeatedly raised concerns over these issues directly with the UK Government and the Government of Pakistan and we will continue to do so. Uh, we also strongly support international processes such as UN scrutiny of the record of individual member states. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you. First Minister, on Saturday many small independent shops up and down our high streets across Scotland will take part in Small Business Saturday such as Swan's Shoe Shop and the Tony Huggins Hay Gallery in Kelso. However, we hear today that the number of Scottish retailers going bust is on the rise, according to research by French Duncan. And amongst other cost pressures, rising business rates are being blamed. When will the First Minister realise that her government's high tax agenda is punishing our high streets and take urgent action to support Scotland's retailers? First Minister. Uh, well, can I firstly say that I fully support Small Business uh, Saturday to uh, celebrate that. I'll be visiting uh, a small business in my own constituency, a small business called Category uh, is Books, an LGBTI uh, bookshop that's recently opened in my uh, constituency. And I hope members uh, will take the opportunity to support small businesses across the country. I have to say, though, it's a bit rich to have uh, the member stand up here and talk about uh, business rates. It's this government that introduced the small <coughs> business bonus. Uh, benefiting many small businesses across the country. It's this government that continues to support uh, the small business bonus. And of course, in Scotland, uh, including the small business bonus, but many other reliefs, we have the best package of business rates relief of any country in the UK. Uh, I think Rachel Hamilton actually should support and welcome that. Yeah. Yeah. Neil Findlay. This week, uh, Panorama exposed very serious failings in the regulation and testing of med medical devices and implants. Uh, this is a global issue with dozens and dozens of countries affected. Uh, it's very clear that the system in the UK, the EU and indeed across the world is not fit for purpose. So as a positive step, uh, will the Scottish Government now introduce a register of all implants? But we are happy to give consideration to anything that lies within our power. Of course, as the member is aware, the regulation uh, of these devices is a reserved matter. Uh, responsibility lies with uh, the Medical and Healthcare Registry Authority. Uh, and we have uh, written to them on, I think, more than one occasion asking for them to take action. But as we have done with mesh implants, uh, we will continue to look at what we can do uh, within our own powers. And I'll ask the Health Secretary to look into the specific uh, suggestion uh, and write to uh, the member in due course. And Sandra White.
you very much, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, it was reported this week that the Ministry of Defence are paying over 200 civilian staff in Scotland less than the real living wage. Will the First Minister join with me and many others in calling for a real living wage and for the powers to be implemented to be devolved to this Parliament? First Minister. Uh, yes, I would uh, echo that call. I think the MOD uh, and all uh, government agencies should pay the real living wage. The Scottish Government is a real living wage uh, employer. Um, of course, Scotland has a higher proportion of workers paid the real living wage than any other UK nation, but we recognise there is still work to do. Uh, and I do look forward to the day, and I hope we can persuade others across the Chamber to support this, uh, that employment legislation is devolved uh, to this Parliament so that we can take the action that we consider necessary to ensure that fair work uh, is something that all workers get. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will ban the use of dog shock collars. First Minister. Well, as the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment announced in January of this year, we have introduced guidance which was widely accepted and reported at the time as being an effective ban on the use of electric dog collars as training aids. Uh, this is not a legislative ban on the use of such collars and was never intended to be, but it is intended to avoid the misuse of these collars and ultimately prevent unnecessary suffering by dogs. Uh, I appreciate that some members think we should go further equally. I understand that some people think we've already gone too far, but the Cabinet Secretary committed to issuing the guidance, and that is what we have done. She also committed, however, to review the effectiveness of the guidance after 12 months and consider if any further action is required, and that is exactly what we will do. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, First Minister Ransom. Unfortunately, what the Cabinet Secretary said in January, and I quote, I have decided to take steps to effectively and promptly ban their use in Scotland. Of course, that's not what happened. As the First Minister said, guidance was issued. However, many animal welfare organisations now, such as the Dogs Trust, Kennel Club, SSPC, and people like myself, want a straightforward ban, as there is in Wales. With no ban, can the First Minister tell me how effective is that guidance? And can the First Minister advise if there's been any reduction in usage? First Minister. Well, can I thank Christine Graham for her question. During the Parliament's debate on this matter back in January, and indeed during discussions with stakeholders on the wording, it was clearly recognised that the guidance would be advisory. The Kennel Club uh, said at the time, and I'm quoting, uh, that it welcomes the Scottish Government's effective ban on shock training devices, and that, quote, strict guidance has been published, which provides advice on training methods and training aids for dogs. Uh, the guidance was only recently published uh, on the 15th of October, so it is too soon to comment meaningfully on the effect of it. Uh, as I said earlier, we've committed to reviewing its impact after 12 months. Uh, we will do this in light of the practical experience of Scottish enforcement bodies and any new legislation in other administrations, and we will then consider uh, whether any improvements need to be made to the approach that we have taken. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on reforming the rules regarding the temporary release and parole of prisoners. First Minister. As we committed to in this year's programme for government, we will consult in measures to improve the openness and transparency of the parole system and how we can strengthen the voice of victims and their families in this process. The consultation will be published before the end of this year and we will take action informed by the responses we receive. Uh, we also committed to ensure that victims and their families receive better information and greater support ahead of prison release arrangements and these issues will be considered by the new Victims Task Force which will hold its first meeting on the 12th of December. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, can I welcome the First Minister's partial commitments on parole reform, though whether this consultation translates into real action for victims and families is another matter. Michelle's law is also about strengthening victim and family rights before temporary release from prison is granted. It was the temporary release of Michelle Stewart's killer that kick-started the campaign. The SNP must deliver on Michelle's law. So will the First Minister commit today to expanding this consultation to cover temporary release? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I pay tribute again to the family of Michelle Stewart uh, in their campaign, which I think is having uh, a real impact on these issues. Uh, as the member, I know, uh, understands, parole and temporary release are two entirely separate processes. 
Uh, we absolutely recognise the importance of strengthening the voice of victims and their families in both parole and temporary release. Uh, that's why we committed to action to improve both in the programme for government. Uh, that included a commitment to consult on measures to improve the openness of parole processes and that consultation will seek views on how we can strengthen the voice and role of victims and their families and it will cover uh, the issues raised in the Michelle's Law proposal as they relate to parole. And as I said, the consultation will be published before the end of this year. Uh, temporary release from prison is not controlled by the parole board, so that will not be part of this consultation. However, we are committed to improving the support and information available in relation to temporary prison release arrangements and uh, that's why th that issue will be considered by the new Victims Task Force. And as I said a moment ago, uh, that will meet for the first time uh, on the 12th of December and will be co-chaired uh, by the Justice Secretary and the Lord Advocate. So I uh, hope that assures the member that both of these issues and these very different processes uh, will be properly and fully considered. Daniel Johnson. Automatic release was introduced in 1993 by the Conservative government and while early release is an important part of rehabilitation, it can lead to confusion about the time that will be spent by someone at the point of sentencing. So does the First Minister agree with me on the importance of transparency in sentencing in particular, but also uh, with me that the scope and indeed resource available to the Sentencing Council must be reviewed given that it's taken three years to publish two pages of guidance? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Daniel Johnson for raising that question? Of course, as uh, I know he also uh, knows, early release is not the same as temporary release. Uh, but all of these issues uh, will be looked at fully by the Victims Task Force. And it's because uh, all of uh, these issues will be included that the Lord Advocate is co-chairing uh, that group. So I, I know there are uh, a number of concerns around how these processes operate at the moment. They are all in place uh, for good reasons, uh, many of them. <coughs> to do with the rehabilitation of prisoners back into society. But it is also vital uh, that there is appropriate and proper uh, protection for the public and that the voice of victims and of victims' families is heard. So uh, both on the consultation on parole arrangements, but also in the wider consideration of these issues by the Victims Task Force, uh, the issue being raised by Daniel uh, Johnson will receive proper consideration. Thank you. Question six, Colin Smith. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that ScotRail has failed to fully deliver 29 franchise obligations. First Minister. Well, Colin Smith refers to committed obligations. What he doesn't mention is that of the 272 obligations in total, ScotRail has already delivered 128, with a further 115 on track for delivery by their due date. Of the remaining obligations, 14 are overdue, and we expect uh, most of those to be achieved in 2019. 15 are categorised as having a challenging delivery date. Transport Scotland is working closely with ScotRail to ensure delivery of all committed obligations which will deliver passenger benefits across the network. Uh, with a programme of this scale, it is normal for some delivery outcomes to change, uh, but the focus when managing such changes is always the best interest of the passenger. Colin Smith. Well, it's disappointing the First Minister seems so dismissive of the fact ScotRail are not delivering important obligations. Clearly, improved journey times, integrated ticket and station investment, clearly not important to the First Minister. But it's not just on these 29 franchise obligations that ScotRail are failing. Punctuality has plummeted to a new low with almost one in five trains running late. Passengers are sick and tired and deserve better. Now, so far, the First Minister's response has been to, to give ScotRail a free pass to breach their PPM benchmarks and to team up with the Tories to block Labour's plan to end this failing franchise. Now, can the First Minister tell us how bad does it have to get before she takes meaningful action? If the First Minister won't end this failing franchise, can she answer this straightforward question? Does the First Minister honestly believe that ScotRail will hit its 92.5% PPM target, yes or no? And if it's yes, when? First Minister. Well, can I say to the member, uh, I wasn't dismissive. I gave him the full facts on the question he was asking. Uh, I think probably uh, some of those facts were inconvenient for the question that he wanted to follow up with, but that's not really uh, my worry. Um, on the... On the 29 obligations, as I said, 14 listed as overdue. These, uh, we expect most of these to be achieved in 2019. Of the 15 obligations where the delivery date is considered challenging, most have the potential to be achieved in the first part 
of 2019. In terms of uh, wider uh, issues with delays uh, that he talks about, of course, uh, we deeply regret any inconvenience to passengers. Uh, I think uh, around half, sometimes more than half of all delays on the ScotRail network, of course, are the responsibility of Network Rail. Uh, as I've said many times in the past, Network Rail is not the responsibility of this Parliament. I look forward to getting the support of Labour members to make it the responsibility of this Parliament. But on that issue, uh, I'm sure Colin Smith is aware uh, that just this morning the Office of Road and Rail took formal action against Network Rail to deliver improved performance. And it also confirmed that ScotRail's performance in 2018-19 has been impacted by severe uh, weather. Uh, so that uh, lies behind uh, many of the delays we've seen. We are working uh, with ScotRail to improve uh, performance so that uh, the PPM target uh, is met. Lastly, on the issue of the franchise, of course, it's this government that for uh, the first time, having won the powers, powers that when Labour was in government at Westminster, they refused to give this parliament, it was this government uh, that took action to ensure that there can uh, be a public sector bid for the next franchise. But, you know, if Colin Smith wants us to go further, then again, I invite Labour to join with us uh, and to support a call for the full devolution of powers over rail so that full nationalisation actually could be an option because right now it's not because Labour continues to block these powers coming to the Scottish Parliament. Jimmy Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister thinks that Network Rail are the fault uh, of the majority of delays. What does the First Minister say to passengers that were on the Waverley to Helensburgh service on Monday that were left stuck at Uphall Station when their train decoupled, leaving three carriages behind, stranded uh, at the station? Uh, does the First Minister know why this incident happened? And can she assure the travelling public that nobody in Scotland will be left behind on Scotland's railways? First Minister. Well, the particular incident that the member uh, raises, as I understand it, is currently being investigated uh, by uh, the ORR, and that is the appropriate action to take. Uh, I don't, it's, it's not me claiming that half of the delays uh, are down to network rail. It's a fact that half of the delays are down to network rail. And maybe uh, if all of the members and all of the parties across the chamber could come together and actually demand the devolution of network rail, yeah. then we could have full and integrated responsibility and be able to do even more to improve performance uh, on our railways. So I would be delighted to have the support of the Tories <laughs> and of Labour uh, to make that move. Ross Greer. Thank you. The latest ScotRail performance statistics show that on the Mulgai line, three in four trains are late or cancelled. Does the First Minister believe that ScotRail are fulfilling their obligations to passengers on a line where they can't get three, or three out of every four trains reliably? First Minister. Uh, the Donovan Review, which I'm sure the member is aware of, is looking at particular specific actions to deal with issues on that line. Uh, but of course, no, I don't think that's acceptable for uh, passengers. Uh, that performance level is not acceptable, which is why uh, we are working with ScotRail and it's why we set uh, stringent expectations of ScotRail uh, to take the action that improves uh, performance and improves the passenger experience. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move to members' business. Oh, point of order from Maurice Curry. Point of order, please. Uh, <clears throat> Last Thursday, in First Minister's questions, an SNP member in this chamber caused unnecessary concern over nuclear safety events at Fast Lane in respect to our UK submarine fleet by using political spin on the actual facts, producing an in inaccurate order, picture. please. Let's hear the member. Presiding officer. This causes alarm for our armed forces service men and women serving in the UK submarine fleet and keeping the UK safe as the fleet moves in total to Faz Lane. We hope their families will join them to live in Scotland and we must support our UK submarine fleet crews and families and not make inaccurate statements in this chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Corey. Uh, the point Mr Corey made is actually very similar to the one that I think Ms Bailey made last week, which is it's a political point responding to another political opinion, which all members are allowed to express, but it's not a point of order. Thank you very much. We're going to move to members' business in the name of Tom Arthur on St Andrew's Day 2018, and we'll just have a short suspension while the, the gallery clears and uh, the members and ministers change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>